Good evening, um, and uh, welcome to the New England Aquarium and our uh, lecture series for the fall 2017 season. Uh, we're able to offer these lectures free to the public thanks to the generous support of the Lowell Institute. Um, and there's a schedule of some upcoming lectures on our website, uh, and I encourage all of you to have a look there at that. Um, I know you know what these are. They're noisy. They disturb people. Please make sure they're off before the, uh, our guest starts her lecture. Thank you very much. And anything else that beeps. Um, and uh, also, tonight our lecture is going to be filmed by our partners at WGBH. Uh, this lecture and many others are available um, on the New England Aquarium YouTube channel as well as WGBH's forum network. So um, I encourage you again to take advantage of that resource um, and share it with your friends and your family and your colleagues. Um, so I, my name is Tim Warner. I'm a senior scientist here at the New England Aquarium. Um, and uh, it's really a great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Jennifer Francis. Um, and she's going to talk to us about her research. There's her um, beautiful introductory image out there. It's going to talk about the jet stream. It's going to talk about climate. It's going to talk about the Arctic meltdown. Um, climate change is obviously something that's front and center in the news these days and uh, has some bearing on a lot of um, meteorological events that we've all um, had to go through. Um, she's going to uh, discuss her research and that gives evidence about Arctic warming, how it contributes to some of these weather patterns, uh, and how they become more persistent and uh, can then lead to the sorts of extremes that were uh, witnessing droughts, cold spells, heat waves, and as well as flooding. So she, it looks like she kind of followed the jet stream a little bit in her career. Um, she got a BS in meteorolo meteorology from San Jose State University in 1998, PhD in atmospheric scientist from the University of Washington in 1994. That was when the jet stream shifted a little bit up north maybe. Uh, she's a re right now, she's a research professor at Rutgers in the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences. And, um, and she founded and co-directed uh, that university's Climate and Environmental Change Initiative. So uh, in addition to her research, she and her husband has cir have circumnavigated the world in a sailboat between 1980 and 1985 including uh, visits to Cape Horn in the Arctic, during which her interest in weather in the Arctic began. So please uh, join me in welcome, welcoming Jennifer, and uh, as she's going to talk about crazy weather and the Arctic meltdown, how are they connected? All right, thank you very much, Tim. Thank you very much to the Aquarium for inviting me to be here tonight. It's really exciting to be here. And I know I'm talking to fellow New Englanders who love weather. So, uh, you know, I grew up listening to Don Kent. Some of you might be old enough to remember Don Kent and uh, loving his uh, forecasts on the TV. So, um, you know, we live with a lot of exciting weather in this part of the world, and I'm convinced that that's what got me interested in the first place. But when I went to school, and as Tim mentioned, when we went sailing back there in the 80s, uh, we went up to the Arctic in our sailboat. And at the time, which was in 1984, uh, there was very little weather information available to us back then. It was hard to get. What we got didn't mean much. It was pretty wrong most of the time. And so I decided at that point I wanted to become a meteorologist, that that was a part of the world that I could focus on because obviously we didn't know a whole lot about what was going on up there. So when I started in school, I thought I wanted to go into forecasting, but very soon thereafter I got the bug for research. But while I was in school, climate change really wasn't a thing yet. Um, the Arctic had not really started to change much yet. It was really not till the mid-1990s or so, after I would got my PhD, um, we started to notice that the Arctic was really changing in a big way. 
And so I focused mainly on the Arctic itself, um, how it was changing, why it was changing. And it's really only in the last five years that I've started to focus my research on not just the Arctic meltdown, which I'm going to talk about a lot tonight, but also how it's connected to our weather patterns. We're changing the Arctic so much and so fast that I thought there's got to be an impact on the rest of the circulation system and affecting our weather patterns here. But the really tricky question is how these two things are connected to each other. So that's what I'm going to try to explain to you tonight. So I'm sure you're all well aware that Mother Nature has just gone berserk in the last few years. We've seen all kinds of extreme weather events transpiring all over the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the coast of the UK has had some of the worst winters they've ever had in the last few years, just bombarded by storm after storm after storm. There are places in Northern Japan where they're used to getting a fair bit of snow, but in this particular winter of 2012, they had more snow than they've ever had. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd love to see the snow plow that <laughs> keeps that road clear. <laughs> Last summer of 2016, we had record flooding in Louisiana and many other places. We all remember that crazy winter of 2015, right? Record-breaking snow in Boston, which is saying a lot. This past summer, we saw Hurricane Harvey wreak all kinds of havoc in Houston, still playing out there. And in Europe, they had a heck of a summer with all kinds of heat waves in central part of Europe, southern Europe, a lot of forest fires, while the UK and Scandinavia had an incredibly wet, cold summer. And of course, we know that California has been living with some very severe drought for the last several years. Well, we scientists are not the only ones who are interested in these extreme weather events that are increasing around, especially the northern hemisphere. The insurance company is very interested in this, as you might well imagine. And this is data that was collected by an insurance company called Munich Re. They actually insure insurance companies. And what you notice here, these bars going back to 1980 are showing uh, the frequency of particular types of extreme events. The red bars are events that are related to what we call geophysical events, so things like earthquakes and tsunamis, um, volcanoes, things that don't have anything to do with weather. But the other three colors of bars all are related to weather in some way. And so what you notice is those geophysical events have not changed in their frequency, but the weather event related uh, extreme events have. So we see this definite increase in the number of these extreme, extreme events. So all those examples I showed you, all those pictures, all had something in common, those particular extreme events. Anybody want to hazard a guess what that might be? Okay. Well, I'll tell you then. So these are all the types of extreme events that have to do with weather patterns that have become persistent. They've become stuck, all right? So when I talk about extreme events from now on as, a connect, as they're connected to the Arctic, I'm talking about the kind of extreme events that are related to very persistent weather patterns. So for example, if it's dry for a week or two, no big deal. But if it goes on for months or even years, it can turn into a pretty significant drought. So that's the idea. All right, so I want to step back first and kind of set the stage a little bit here. I'm sure most of you here are very aware of the fact that our climate is changing. Well, you've probably heard from some people that are a little bit skeptical of what's going on right now that the climate has always changed, and this is just a natural cycle. Well, let's take a look at that. Here we are looking at two graphs, two curves here. The red is what the Earth's temperature has been doing over the last 400,000 years or so. All right? You can clearly see that it's been up and down over that time period. And those ups and downs in temperature, we understand very well what caused those. It's because of shifts in the Earth's orbit around the sun. And they're very regular. 
when the temperatures warm back then, that's when we had a, what we call an interglacial period, when the Earth was warm. And when it gets colder, and you'll notice it's only several degrees that separates those, that was an ice age. So we, the Earth has fluctuated back and forth between these warm periods and ice ages. Along with that, the blue curve there is showing you the, how much carbon dioxide there was in the atmosphere at the same time. And you'll see that they're very closely related to each other. Until you get to the present time, here we are with over 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere right now. You can see it's nothing like it's been in approximately half a million years. We are completely off the chart. And we know exactly where that carbon dioxide came from. It came from mostly burning fossil fuels. But you, what, what you may also notice is that the temperature hasn't caught up with that carbon dioxide yet. It, there's a big lag in the system. We have put that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so fast that the Earth has not had time to catch up to being in equilibrium with that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But one thing we do know is the last time we saw carbon dioxide levels this high, which was many millions of years ago, we know that the globe was several degrees warmer than it is now, and we know that sea levels were tens of feet higher. So this is where we're going. So I'm guessing that most of you know what greenhouse gases are and why we care about them, but let's just quickly review. So why do we care about this carbon dioxide so much? Well, here we have our, a little schematic of how the Earth's climate system works. We have the sun up there in the sky, roughly 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And we know that hot things like stars and our sun emit energy at very short wavelengths. Okay? This is the light we can see with our eyes. That very short wavelength energy penetrates right through our atmosphere, except for when it hits a cloud. Most of it makes it to the surface, and it warms the surface of the Earth. The Earth, on the other hand, is more like 60 degrees on average. And warm things also emit energy, but at much longer wavelengths. Okay, We call it infrared radiation, or long wave radiation. And it just so happens that long wave radiation is absorbed by greenhouse gases. And you can see that layer of greenhouse gases laying on top of the Earth. So what happens? The Earth emits these, this long wave energy. It's trapped by the greenhouse gases and emitted back down to the Earth. It's just like putting a blanket on the Earth. And they're there naturally. But when we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas, it's just like putting an extra blanket on your bed. It traps more heat down by the surface. So by adding so much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we're trapping a lot more of that heat that the Earth is emitting. All right, so I said that the temperature of the Earth hasn't caught up yet to the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere, but it's trying to. Over the last 17 years, we've had 16 of the warmest years on record. And just looking at the very warmest four years, we've got, you can see that they're just in the last couple couple of years here. Until we put 2016 on the chart, you can see that 2016 has completely blown the other years out of the water. It was the warmest by far. So by the way, if anybody has a question, please feel free to stick your hand up. So let's get to the Arctic now. I want to draw that same graph, but looking at the Arctic. And let me just mention one thing that I forgot to mention. You might remember that the Paris Accord was aiming for two degrees of global warming. Well, here we are bumping up against 1.5 already in 2016. So we're getting very close to that limit that we're trying to reach, or trying not to reach, actually. Getting awfully close. All right, but then when we go to look at the Arctic, things look very different. Here's what those same years look like in terms of the anomalies of the temperature of the Arctic, so how different those temperatures are from what they should be over, this, over these few years. Notice the scale. 1.5 is way down at the bottom. We're up here in the 6, 7, 8 degrees centigrade above normal in the Arctic. The Arctic is warming much, much faster than anywhere else on the globe. 
And if we look at it spatially, here we are looking down on the North Pole. You can see the USA on the left and Asia on the right. And what you notice is spatially as well, this is for winter, but the warming over the Arctic is much, much larger than it is anywhere else. And you see this very interesting pattern of cooling happening in the eastern US. Think some of our most recent winters around here. They've been quite cold. Look over at Asia, much colder than normal. What the heck's going on there? That's what we're going to get to the bottom of today. All right, so how do we know that humans are responsible for this extra warming that we're seeing? Well, we have a lot of ways to, to figure that, that question out. But probably the most um, useful way, the most, I think, compelling way, is that we have these very good computer models, computer simulations, they're basically just a whole bunch of equations that simulate all the processes that happen in the real climate system. They make rain, they make snow, they make currents in the ocean, they make winds, they make storms. And we can use these climate models to try to look back in time and look forward in time and simulate how the Earth's climate um, should behave. So if we do that with one of these models and we simulate what the Earth's temperature um, was going back in time, but we only tell the model about some of the natural changes that have happened, things like um, volcanoes that have erupted or changes in the solar output, things like that. Um, so going back to, say, 1900 there, we see that the blue line is where, is what the model is saying happened in the past, and the black line is what the real world actually did. So you can see that the model and the real world match up pretty darn well. So we have pretty good confidence in these models. However, if we continue on to near present, we get this split. The model actually thinks the Earth should be getting cooler. That's because the sun is actually getting a little weaker. And the real world is warming. So why the split? Because we didn't tell the model that carbon dioxide was increasing in the atmosphere. And if we do that, and we compare the model now in red to the real world in black, we see that there's a very good match. So this is one of the ways that we can know for sure that because we're increasing greenhouse gases, we're getting this extra warming happening in the atmosphere. So and it's not just the temperature that's changing. We're also seeing the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere increase. Over the last, well, going back to the 1970s, we've seen about a 7% increase in the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. So why would you care about water vapor? We should care a lot, because water vapor is one of the main things that fuels storms. We have more water vapor in the atmosphere. When that water vapor condenses, it releases heat, and it provides energy for storms. Of course, it also makes more rain. And what we're seeing is that over the last several decades, compared to the beginning of the century, we see that the frequency of heavy downpours and heavy precipitation events has increased dramatically, especially in the Northeast here where we live. 71% increase since, say, the 1950s or so. It's a big, big change. All right, so let's start talking more about the Arctic. Other way. There we go. So another symptom of climate change, as you, I'm sure, have heard, is that the amount of ice in the Arctic is disappearing. In particular, the sea ice. The sea ice is floating on the Arctic Ocean. Just to remind you, the Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land, whereas Antarctica is a continent with a big, huge pile of ice on top surrounded by ocean. Two very different places. So the Arctic sea ice we can go back and look at the last 1,500 years or so and get a pretty good idea of how much sea ice there was floating on the Arctic Ocean. How do we do that? We look at sediments in the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, and depending on what kind of critters are living in that mud, we can know whether there was light available or not, ice there or not. So uh, that's how we can reconstruct roughly how much sea ice there was. So if we do that, 
we see that going back about 1,500 years or so, the amount of sea ice floating on the Arctic Ocean, and this is the real estate covered by that sea ice, hasn't changed too much. It wiggles up and down a bit, but it's, it stayed pretty steady until we get to about 1960 or 70, somewhere in there. And here we see a big, big change, along with that very rapid warming that's happening in the Arctic. Big decline in the amount of sea ice, and this only goes up to about 2,000. If we put the last few years on here, you can't even fit it on the same graph. We are in uncharted territory. 2012 was the lowest amount of sea ice we've ever had in the summertime in the Arctic. That's the standing record right now. But the last few years have been very, very close to that. And I could have put 2017 on here. 2017 came in at about number six. So we're in this regime now of much, much less sea ice in terms of its area of aerial extent, its real estate that it covers. We've lost half in 30 years. If you take into account the thickness and you calculate the volume of that ice, we've lost three quarters of the sea ice floating in the Arctic Ocean in only 30 years. This is just a huge change. So if we look at how the sea ice thickness has changed over this period, I think you'll get an even better feel and maybe this will sink into your head and you'll never forget it looking at how the thickness of the sea ice in the Arctic has changed just since the late 1970s. So here we have an animation. Every year is plotted on here with colors. The pink and purpley colors are thicker ice. And what you can see over that time is that we're losing all the thick ice in the Arctic Ocean. When we lose all that thick ice, we're left with very thin ice. It's much more vulnerable to any shifts in the wind because the wind can move it around. It's easier to melt it away. It's become much more sensitive. So getting back to temperature now, if we look at how the Arctic temperature has changed going back to the late 1940s, that's in blue. And if we compare that to how the temperature of where we live, which is called the mid-latitudes, has changed, that's in red. So what you notice, as I've kind of alluded to several times already, is that the Arctic has warmed much, much faster than the mid-latitudes have where we live. This difference in temperature between the Arctic change and down here where we are is something we call Arctic amplification. It's an amplification of the warming of the globe. It's happening faster there than anywhere else. And in 2016, this difference hit a new record, right? Record amount of warming in the Arctic. So who cares about that? Yes? You care, good. Did you have a question? Why the Arctic is seeing an increase in temperature? Yep. Yes. So the question is, geographically speaking, why is the Arctic warming up so fast and not somewhere else? Is that right? OK. So the reason the Arctic is warming so fast, one of the reasons, there's actually a whole bunch of reasons, but the easiest one to explain and the simplest one to understand is that when we lose all this ice that's floating on the Arctic Ocean, that ice is very bright. So when the sun's energy hits it, most of it goes right back to outer space. It never enters the climate system. It never warms anything. So if we lose a bunch of that ice because of the globe of warming, because of greenhouse gases, then we shrink that ice. That means that's what, what's left there, where the ice used to be, is ocean. And it's very dark. So that ocean absorbs all that sunshine instead warms up the water and melts even more ice, which reflects even less of the sun's energy, which absorbs even more into the ocean, which melts even more ice. And this is something we call a positive feedback. So this is the main reason. There's several other positive feedbacks that happen in the Arctic as well, but that's the main one, and it's the easiest one to explain. So 
the reason is because the if you lose the ice you're left with a dark surface there that absorbs the energy instead of reflecting it back to outer space so the earth as a whole is absorbing a lot more energy from the sun than it used to when we had a lot of ice there okay okay all right so why do we care about this arctic warming so fast all right so i want you to think about a layer of air all right this layer of air extends from boston all the way up to the arctic all right so we know that air expands when it warms right we know that it's warmer here than it is in the arctic so that layer of air is thicker here than it is in the arctic all right just the way it's depicted there so imagine yourself sitting on top of this layer looking towards the north it would look like you were looking down a hill well that's exactly what the air thinks too it feels that pull downhill just like water flowing down a mountain and it creates a wind blowing towards the north it's flowing down that hill in the atmosphere but because the earth is spinning everything in the northern hemisphere gets turned to the right so that wind also gets turned to the right and it becomes what we call the jet stream. And the jet stream is this ribbon of fast moving wind high over our heads up where the jets fly. Okay? Now, think back to Arctic amplification. The rapidly warming Arctic, what's happening? It's warming faster in the Arctic. So the thickness of that layer is growing faster up there than it is here. It's making that hill less steep. So there's less force driving that wind towards the north. We're weakening the winds of the jet stream. And when the jet stream gets weaker, it tends to take a wavier path as it travels around the northern hemisphere. It's more easily deflected from its path by things like mountains and different temperatures over the ocean and things like that. So anything that's when, it, when the winds are weaker, they're more easily deflected. And so we see these bigger north-south swings in the jet stream. So why do you care about that? Well, there are actually two effects that we need to take into account here. And that AA stands for Arctic amplification. The first one I just told you about, where the winds are actually getting weaker. This is something we can measure. It is happening now. and We expect it, we expect it to get even more so in the future. The other thing that we see happening is that those northward swings, which we call ridges, are getting longer. They're, getting, they're extending farther towards the north. And I'll show you an example of that towards the end. And both of these things are important because it's causing this waviness to increase in the jet stream. So on the left here, we have an example with a very cold Arctic. It was a day in November 2013. You can see that blue color centered over the North Pole, and the jet stream is indicated with those red arrows. And you can see the jet stream tends to be quite straight, flowing west to east around the northern hemisphere. But when the Arctic warms up a lot, like the case on the right, and you might recognize that because that was when the so-called polar vortex attacked us in July of 2014, 14. Um, you can see northern North America down at the bottom there. So we had that big dip in the jet stream over us. All that cold air from the Arctic plunged down over Boston and stayed there for a long time. So you can see all around the northern hemisphere when the Arctic is warm, those cold blobs, those blue blobs, are extending farther south. And it makes those waves in the jet stream get bigger. And what you're going to find out is that they also tend to move much more slowly. So why do we care about these waves anyway in the jet stream? Well, it turns out they create our weather. Here's a schematic to show you how this works. So here's a typical wave in the jet stream over the United States. We see this big ridge, the northward swing over California, the dip over where we live. And the first thing you notice is that the jet stream there separates the cold air that's to the north of it from the warm air that's to the south of it. So if the jet stream is, in this case, it's just north of us, we'd be in the warm part. So we'd have warmer than normal air, all right? 
But the other thing is this wave in the jet stream is actually what creates the high pressures, the low pressures, the blue skies, and the storms that we experience. So in the part of the jet stream over the west in this schematic, where the winds are coming out of the northwest, is where we get nice clear sky, dry, no storms. That's been the case over California for much of the last few years, leading to their drought there. And us, over on the other side here, we've tended to be, especially in the winter, in the stormy part of the jet stream. So when the winds are coming from the southwest, bringing a lot of heat and moisture up from the Gulf of Mexico, when the pattern is like this, that's when we tend to get our nor'easters. But the point is, when these waves are really large like this, they tend to stick around a long time. And here's a schematic that shows this to you. Oh, you're not moving. It was moving just fine before. Oops. Oh, checked it right before. Well, anyway, if this were working properly, you'd see that on the top one there, where the waves are relatively small, you can see they're shifting quite quickly from west to east. So what you'd experience is that your weather would change quite rapidly. You'd go from that stormy part of the jet stream to the dry part of the jet stream. But when the waves get big, like they are on the bottom, this is showing them totally stuck. If this, if this were working, they'd move a little bit to the right there. So they move more slowly from west to east. This is the idea, OK? The Arctic is warming really fast, and we think it's causing these waves to get bigger which means that they're causing our weather patterns to become more persistent. This is the basic idea. If you don't remember anything else from tonight, that's what you should remember. But now we've got the real atmosphere to look at here. Those nice, simple diagrams make it sound easy. But in fact, the real winds of the upper levels are very, very messy. And it's very, very difficult to figure out whether they're changing, how do you even measure these things? You can see that there, there's little swirls everywhere. So these are actual winds from about a three-week period put together in an animation by NASA. Where the red and yellow colors are or where the winds are really strong, you can pick out where that jet stream is yourself very easily. Let's run it one more time. Okay, I guess we're not going to watch it one more time. All right, so the idea here is then where the research is right now is figuring out whether the jet stream is becoming wavier or not. And as you saw, it's a very messy system. It's not an easy thing to measure. But let me just show you some of the ways that we're going about it, some of the simple ways. So what we can do is look down on the atmosphere from above and think of it like a topographic map that you'd use for hiking, all right? So here we are looking down on the North Pole and these colors are telling us where that layer of the atmosphere that we talked about, you remember that had the hill in it? The red colors are where that layer is very thick and the blue colors are telling us where that layer is very thin. So where it's warm and where it's cold. And if you're a hiker, you'll know that when you see these lines on a topographic map, it means that if you follow one, you'll stay at the same elevation as you walk along. So when they're very, very close together, like they are there, that means that hill is really steep. Same thing in the atmosphere. When that hill is really steep, that's where we see the very strong winds. That's where the jet stream is, all right? So with your eye, you can see, you can follow it around and see where the warm air is to the south over the tropics, where the cold air is over the Arctic, and where the jet stream is that goes around. So let's zoom in on North America here. Same map, just over North America. So what we do is we pick one of these lines of equal height or equal thickness in the atmosphere, and we track it, and we pick a line that's right in the strongest part of that hill, so we know we're in the jet stream, okay? And this is a very simple-minded metric, but as you'll see, it works pretty darn well. And the idea is every single day, we look for that line, we see how far north it goes, 
we see how far, how, how far south it goes, we measure that difference in latitude, and when it's bigger than a certain amount, we call it a big wave. All right? And we do that every single day, and we track it. And if we do that, we can have a time series. We can look at how these wavy patterns have changed over time. So if we do that for the whole northern hemisphere now, we're looking at the fall. And going back to the late 1970s, the green line is showing you how often these wavy patterns have happened. And what you notice very clearly is that they're increasing over time. Also plotted on there is the strength of the winds, the west to east winds of the jet stream. And you can see that they are clearly decreasing, just as we thought they should. So if we focus in on North, the North Atlantic now, which has a lot to do with our weather, we see that the frequency of these big waves is increasing even more, and the winds are decreasing even more. Okay, so we've got some evidence that this is actually happening. All right, so the other thing I mentioned that I said I'd get back to is that these ridges or these bumps, northward swings in the jet stream, are getting bigger. All right, so this is bringing up a new hypothesis that I and my colleagues are working on, and we've given it a catchy name. We call it Takes Two to Tango. So what's up with that? So here's the idea. All right, so we're looking at the Pacific Ocean and North America here. Back in the good old days when the Arctic Ocean was filled with ice, you can see all that white ice up there north of the continents. And let's say a wave in the jet stream comes along. All right, there's your ridge, there's your trough. The ice isn't changing much, so there's really no effect of what's going on in the Arctic with, with those ridges and troughs. All right, in the good old days, nothing was going on. But let's fast forward to what's happening now. You see that big chunk of ice that's gone north of Alaska. And as I said, during the summertime then, whoop, when we lose all that ice, instead of reflecting that sun's energy back to outer space, it's getting absorbed into the ocean there, warming it up. And then in the fall, when the air gets cold again, all of that heat that was absorbed in the summer gets readmitted back into the atmosphere. And it warms up that atmosphere, OK? So what happens when a wave in the jet stream comes along? Well, if that wave happens to be located there, which it could very well be according to what the sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean happen to be doing, then there's no opportunity for that extra heat in the Arctic to do anything to that ridge. They're completely separate from each other. There's no interaction. However, if the ridge happens to be located right where that ice was lost, then that extra heat goes into thickening that layer. I mean, keep remembering that thickness of the layer. That's key to this whole idea. We add extra heat to it. We pump that layer up even more. And we see that the ridge gets even larger. OK? What does a larger wave do? Moves more slowly, right? So the combination of the ridge being in the right place with the ice loss and the warming that happens right in the same location of the ridge, that's the two that have to happen to tango. All right, it turns out there's quite a bit of evidence that this is actually happening. Now, this is a little complicated, but I want you to see this because it's, there's, as you can see, there's a number of research papers that have come out just in the last few years that have all identified this connection. All right, so we're over on the Asian side of the world here. And you'll notice there's a, a time scale that goes along the bottom. We start in the September, and it goes all the way over to February. All right, so we're looking at how the system evolves over the winter time. So on the, in September there, we're looking down on the Earth. That blue curve there is the jet stream, all right? And you'll notice that over Scandinavia, there's a ridge there. This happens to be a favored place for ridges to occur, all right? this northward bump. 
it also happens to be the place where sea ice is disappearing the fastest. All right? So we've got the ridge in the right place. We've got sea ice disappearing right in that place. What's happening? The ridge is getting stronger. It's extending farther north. And what does that do? It pumps a lot of cold air down into Central Asia from the Arctic. And what does that do? It plunges the jet stream farther south, just like it did when the polar vortex attacked us. All right? So here we've got this stronger ridge, along with a deeper trough, a bigger wave. This is a very persistent pattern, and it's been happening over and over. You think back to the beginning where I showed you the warming over the Arctic in the winter and the cold over Asia and North America. This is why that's happening. All right? So it gets a little more complicated. When we get the jet stream taking this much wavier path, that sends wave energy up into the stratosphere. The stratosphere is above the, where airplanes fly, but it's where the real vortex is. So you can go home now, and when somebody says, what the heck's the polar vortex? You can tell them what the real polar vortex is. It's not what you read in the papers a few winters ago. It's actually way up in the stratosphere. All right? It's that purple ring, like a halo sitting up there. So as that bigger wave happens in the jet stream, it sends some of that wave energy up into the stratosphere, and it completely disrupts the polar vortex. You can see here in February that polar vo the polar vortex is completely ripped apart, and that keeps this wave energy going, both in the polar vortex and in the jet stream and it keeps it cold for a very long time right through the winter. This mechanism has been identified, as I said, by many, many papers. And it's again, it's one of these it takes two to tango ideas. It starts with sea ice, it starts with a ridge in the right place, and it ends up with uh, a very cold winter in Central Asia. Okay, I'm gonna end with talking a little bit about hurricanes because they've been in the news so much this year, and a lot of people have been wondering whether there's any connection between these really bizarre hurricanes we've had this year and climate change, and maybe even an Arctic connection. Well, I'm here to tell you there's absolutely no doubt about it. There is a connection. We've seen more intense storms, we've seen more rapidly developing storms, and we've seen storms taking some very odd paths. All right? So, a fact. As we've already talked about, we've lost a lot of sea ice. We've also lost a lot of snow in the spring over high latitude land areas. Both of these things together are darkening the earth. We're absorbing a lot more of the sun's energy than we used to because of both of these things. Those are both Arctic things. And as a result, we're putting more heat into the atmosphere we're putting more heat into the oceans. Heat is energy. Heat and energy are what hurricanes need to form. We're warming those oceans, we're warming the air, and we're also increasing the evaporation from the oceans into the air. And remember I said in the beginning how water vapor is increasing and how that water vapor is fuel for storms? Well, both of these things are fuel for storms. So these are adding to the strength of hurricanes. Question. exacerbating, making it worse. Okay, another fact. The loss of land ice, so this is the ice that's sitting on top of Greenland, for example, or glaciers. That ice is sitting up on the land. So when that ice melts, it goes right into the ocean and it adds to the volume of the ocean. And it, right now it's accounting for about half of the sea level rise that we've already observed. So that's another way that tropical storms and all storms for that matter are doing more damage. We've got a higher ocean now, the storm surges are higher than they used to be, and any storm waves are riding on a higher ocean. So these are two ways that the warming in the Arctic is helping to make um, hurricanes both more intense and also do more damage. What's less certain is how the Arctic might be affecting the winds that steer hurricanes. Question over here. Um, 
So the question is, when I say half of sea level rise, I'm talking about we're measuring sea level rise increasing at some rate. Half of it is because of the melting ice. The other half is because the oceans are expanding because they're warming. Just like air expands when it warms, so does water. So that's the two halves of the total observed sea level rise. Okay. So this is a topic of research, whether we're seeing these disrupted wind patterns changing the steering currents of storms. And what come to mind are Har Har Harvey and Sandy. Remember with Harvey, it came very slowly out of the Gulf of Mexico and basically parked over Houston and dumped 50 inches of rain. I mean, that's a lot of snow, but rain, it's unbelievable. And you'll remember Sandy took that crazy left-hand turn and went into New Jersey, affected us as well. There is evidence that what's happening in the summer, especially the loss of snow on high latitude land areas, is pushing the jet stream northward. And that is leaving storms like Harvey without any wind to push them. And that's why Harvey was so stationary. I can't say that, that, was, that the Arctic caused Harvey to be that way, but we expect to see that kind of behavior to happen more often in the future. OK, just to wrap this up, how about 2016? 2016 was a crazy year. I already showed you that it was much warmer than any other year, but it also turns out it had a lot of extreme events. And we can look at what was happening in the Arctic when a lot of those extreme events came along. Question? No, so the extra, so the question is, um, we, we know the warming's happening, the, in both in the atmosphere and the ocean, but what is the role of moisture, right? Okay, so um, as I mentioned earlier when I talked about how the moisture had increased in the global atmosphere by about 7% or so, um, that extra moisture actually, when it evaporates from the ocean and goes into the atmosphere and then it condenses into clouds, it goes from the vapor phase to the liquid phase, it releases heat into the air. So it warms the atmosphere. And that provides even more heat for hurricanes to feed off of. It releases its energy. And not to mention the fact that it produces a lot of rain. OK? Yeah. OK, so back to 2016. So this is a look back at the whole year of 2016 what was going on in the Arctic. So this is looking at the blobs of heat going all the way up into the atmosphere over the Arctic and how they evolved over that whole year. Where it's red, it's when the Arctic had an episode of heating, not just down by the surface, but all the way up through the stratosphere. Okay, But look how, how it, it kind of comes in pulses. It's not kind of a gradual thing. And if we look at these pulses of heat and we line them up with all kinds of extreme events that happened that year, what we notice is that when we get these big pulses of heat in the Arctic, we see floods, we see snowstorms, we see cold events, we see melting events on Greenland, we see heat waves, depending on what time of year you're looking at, all sorts of extreme events. And it's not to say that extreme events can't happen other times, but there is a definite alignment of when we get these big pulses in the Arctic and these extreme events. All right, so what about the future? What are we talking about here? And what can we do about it? Well, we can use those computer models that I described in the beginning to get a handle on what might happen in the future. So here we are in the gray, looking back in time with computer models, the gr light gray color, and then from about 2005 onward is a computer simulation of the future. The black line on there is what the real world has done. 
in terms of how much sea ice there is floating on the Arctic Ocean. So we've seen, as I showed you in the beginning, the amount of sea ice is decreasing over time. The models are able to capture that. Maybe the real world is losing ice a little faster even than the models project. But we have these different outcomes for the future, depending on what we do with emissions of carbon dioxide, getting back to the very beginning of what I talked about. So there's the real world, what's been going on. Here's what, ha what we expect to happen according to the models if we keep going the way we're going, with emitting about the same amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We're going to lose all of the sea ice on the Arctic Ocean in the summer by about the middle of the century. Pretty much all the models agree with that. But if we can reduce our emissions a lot, we'd have to, emit, we'd have to almost stop emitting carbon dioxide to get this to become a solution that is one that we would like to see. But it's possible. It's possible that we can preserve that sea ice in the Arctic and give our children and grandchildren a future that, doesn't, that isn't quite as difficult as it looks like that we're headed for now. So with that, I want to thank you so much. I'd be happy to answer some more questions about this or anything else related to climate change. And again, thank you so much for being here tonight. in the back. Albedo? Okay, so albedo is just a fancy name for how much ice, how much anything reflects the sun's energy, all right? So um, ice has a high albedo, which means that it reflects a lot, and oceans have a very low albedo, which means they reflect very little. So it's, it's just a technical word. I try not to use technical words. Yes. So to boil that long question down into a short one, it's how are we going to reach people who are not buying the argument that climate change is important and that they need to change their behavior so that we can avoid some of the worst consequences of it? <laughs> well, that's a change in behavior, right? How do you convince people to stop eating meat? I mean, there's a lot of things that we need to do to reduce our emissions. So. Well, let me answer hers first, and then I'll get to yours. Um, so it's a tough nut to crack. So um, I think the focus on extreme weather and the fact that it's already happening and that we can confidently say that some amount of the increase in extreme weather that we're seeing is because of climate change. This is not a question anymore. It's true. I think the more that people are experiencing extreme weather, the more they're realizing how much more insurance they're having to pay, how much more they're having to pay for their food, how much they're having to pay to send military overseas to fight battles in places that are dealing with drought and their populations are just miserable. There's a lot of connections that I think can be made to people's lives and to people's pocketbooks. And I think once those connections start to become clearer, then people start to realize that their actions are actually contributing to those difficulties in their lives. So the next question was whether methane release, I think you're talking about cows mostly because it came from your question about meat, um, is affecting the Arctic. Yes. So clearly it's a greenhouse gas yes. and it is definitely increasing. It's coming from the cattle industry, it's coming from the gas industry, it's coming from using gas. I mean, methane comes from many, many things. So 
The good news about methane is that it doesn't last very long in the atmosphere. Once you send a molecule up there, it pretty well goes away fast. It reacts with something else. So if we could curtail methane, we'll see a big impact quickly. The bad thing about methane is that it's a very powerful greenhouse gas. It's much more powerful than carbon dioxide on a molecule per molecule basis. And so it doesn't take much methane to have a big impact. So anything we can do to reduce methane would be a good thing. And while I'm mentioning that, I should also mention that a carbon dioxide molecule in comparison to methane lasts a very long time in the atmosphere. And so once you emit one, it's going to be up there for hundreds of years. So we've already, remember that big spike in carbon dioxide that I showed you that happened very, very recently? I showed you right in the beginning. That's bad because unless we can figure out a way to actually suck it out of the atmosphere, which right now doesn't look like it's a very hopeful situation, we're going to be dealing with the impacts of that extra carbon dioxide for quite a while. You're talking about geoengineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the first part of your question was, is the increase in methane going to affect the Arctic? Well, well that's not even related. But, but okay. Well, the answer is yes. Anything's, any warming, any, anything that, the warming that happens globally is going to be much bigger in the Arctic. Um, the geoengineering question, ways to potentially reduce the amount of sunlight that makes it down to the surface, for example, is a terrible idea. It's absolutely terrible because it has so many inadvertent consequences that we cannot predict. What happens when we try to do something like that and all of a sudden there's a huge drought over Europe and somebody says, oh, well, that's because we did this geoengineering thing. It's all your fault, whoever decided was going to do that. We don't know how the Earth's climate would respond to something like that. Um, the problem is also that if you start a geoengineering regime, you got to keep going. Because if you stop and you don't decrease the greenhouse gases, then the, that, you know, the, the disease is still there. You're just putting a Band-Aid on it. So it's possible that it could buy a little bit of time while we decreased greenhouse gases, but there's too much we don't know about the inadvertent consequences of, of what might happen. Yes. Right. So the question was, do the model simulations that I showed include things like um, methane coming from underwater reserves of clathrates? Um, permafrost thawing, which could, um, the permafrost contains about twice as much carbon as the atmosphere does right now. Um, does it include things like Greenland melting and that fresh water entering the North Atlantic and potentially shutting down the ocean circulation? So in terms of the clathrates and underwater methane releases, they do not. Um, most models capture some of the permafrost release, but in a very rudimentary way, and probably very much underestimate the potential of the release of both carbon dioxide and methane from permafrost. Um, most of them do, however, include the freshwater melt from Greenland and the effect on the ocean circulation. So, I mean, there's a lot of variety in the models. Some of them are more complex and more advanced than others, but the one that I've been showing you results from is one of the more complex ones. Yes. Um, so it sounds that the only way that we could manage this situation is naturally reducing the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that we emit into the atmosphere. So if we go by this and do it drastically, is there an evidence that the Arctic could build up a even the thin layer of the ice pack or it just doesn't really matter? So the question was, um, if we were able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions drastically, 
Would the Arctic refreeze? Is that what you're asking? No. It's just unrealistic. Remember what I said about how long the carbon dioxide lasts in the atmosphere? We've already put so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we cannot go back to where we were unless some miracle comes along that allows us to extract all that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But there's really not any viable hope to do it at a big enough scale right now. And I, I can't imagine that we can get there. So we can't think about that eventuality. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do the best we can do to reduce our emissions and make the future not as bad. The other thing we have to really focus on is understanding how these impacts are going to unfold. Things like severe weather, things like sea level rise, how fast are those things are going to happen, who's going to be affected by what kinds of extreme weather, that sort of thing. And get ready for it. We have to get ready. You know, our towns, our states, our countries, um, we have to understand that this is coming our way and we have to prepare. So changing what crops we grow in a certain place, for example, or raising our roads up in certain areas where we know they're going to get flooded, or m even moving people away from the coast. You know, these are all conversations that are starting to happen, and, and I think they have to. Yep. Question about the polar vortex. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, um, you had been under the, you understood that we would have fewer, or you're saying that what I'm saying, that there are fewer highs and lows based on what you just saw. Um, that is actually not the case. So when I show this pattern of the jet stream in place, like when I, I showed the, the single wave over North America, this is the regime. And moving through that big wave are the individual storms and individual high pressure areas, or the, or the wiggles in the jet stream that create those. And so it's not so much that there are going to be fewer of them. It's just that we're going to be in these regimes longer. So we'll be, think back to the winter that we had all those snowstorms in Boston, OK? So it's not like we had one storm that stayed in one place for a long time. We were in this stormy pattern. So we get storm after storm after storm. That's what I mean. So the lows and highs aren't going to change in number so much, but we'll just have, we'll be in that regime for longer. OK? Back there. So I, mean, I think you could hear him because he's way back there. Um, so oh, for me, OK. So the question was, um, are there some areas in the world that are being affected less by climate change and relative to other places which are being affected more? Absolutely. Um, so the Pacific Northwest, for example, would be a good place to move right now, just saying. Um, they're not looking at more intense hurricanes. Sea level rise is not as much there because the land is actually rising. Um, and it's generally, uh, it, it, it's not expected that the jet stream position is going to have as big of an influence on them overall. Um, probably British Columbia sort of up towards Alaska, not including Alaska, but that general range. So there are definitely places that won't have quite the impacts that other places will. Um, I guess it depends on what you care about. Um, you know, if you're in concerned about drought, then you know you're probably not going to wor be worrying about drought so much up in Nova Scotia. Um, if you care about sea level rise, you know, get away from the coast. If you're caring about um, heavy flooding events, um, you know, I'd move to the southwest. But as long as you don't mind heat waves, because they're going to have the heat waves. So you know, different places are going to have different kinds of extreme events. And that's what I said about needing to understand better 
what kinds of extremes are going to hit what areas so that we can get prepared for those? But that's a great question. Uh, I've gotten you before. Okay. It has been increasing in the fall, just in the fall, not in the spring. In the spring, it's going the other way. But in the fall, the snow's been coming earlier, and it has been getting colder. And this is why. Yeah, but in the fall, there's not much sun, so it doesn't matter. You got to have sun to have that white surface have an impact. Take one more. Okay, one more up there in the plaid shirt. Well, in some places it's going to move north, and in some seasons it's going to move north, but not everywhere. So getting back to this idea of waves, and the whole wave is getting bigger. We're getting bigger, wave, bigger swings northward in those ridges, which tends to cause the troughs to get deeper. So overall, actually the jet stream is expected to shift southward because of the Arctic warming so much. You can think of the warming kind of pushing that jet stream southward. But in the summer, it's actually shifting northward. So it's not a simple answer to that question because it really varies whether you're looking in winter versus summer, continents versus oceans. So it's a, it's a complicated story. And that's where a lot of the research is right now, is understanding what areas are going to have what kinds of changes and why it's happening. So, I think we're done. Thanks again. Yeah, join me again in thanking Dr. Francis.